This is Things Police See, First Hand Accounts, with your host, Steve Gold. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast that interviews active and retired police officers about their most intense, bizarre, and sometimes humorous moments on the job. I'm Steve Gould. Thank you for joining me. Um, you guys have been awesome. Thank you for all the continued letters and messages. I've been on a little bit of a break, um, but I'm back now full force. And uh, boy, do I have a doozy for you today. Um, I just learned recently that um, Lieutenant Joe Kinda would be available to come on the show uh, very excited for that, and I'll get to that in one second. Also, I want to thank all the donors who subscribe monthly and help keep the lights on. You guys are amazing. Um, you pay for all the subscriptions and the website and the podcast hosting and all the stuff I have to do. Um, you guys you guys have really backed me up with that, and I really appreciate it. If you want to be a guest for the show, thingsplease.com, fill out the guest form. Love to have you. Active and retired law enforcement, as I always say. Um, so, Let's get back to the subject in hand here. Episode number 68, Lieutenant Joe Kenda, the homicide hunter himself. Um, he was on for almost a decade. His TV show, uh, wildly popular with true crime fans. Um, just a, a really great and uh, fun and sometimes disturbing show to watch. Um, he did 23 years at the Colorado Springs Police Department. I don't know if you know Colorado Springs. It's, uh, it's a lot bigger than I thought. It's... Uh, well over 400,000 people. It's almost the size of Boston. Uh, so it's a big uh, metropolitan area. Uh, him and his team solved 356 of 387 murders that came across their desk, which is just a really, really great batting average. Um, and he's actually now um, now hosting American Detective on Discovery Plus. So he's not stopping. He's not slowing down. He's got a book coming out. He's got a book called um, Killer Triggers. And uh, of course, his book that came out in 2017 was I Will Find You. So without further ado, let me bring on the guest, Joe Kenda. How are you? Sir, I am good. How are you? I'm well, thanks. Great. Great to have you on the show. It's very nice to be here. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me. Of course. Now, I have to warn you, um, Lieutenant Kenda, Mr. Kenda, I feel like I have to call you some kind of title. Um, nah. I'll, I'll call you Joe. The This is new to me, the video portion. We have a really large um, podcast following, which is the meat and potatoes of everything that we do here. But um, sure. the, the video is a new thing that we're doing, and I think it adds uh, a nice aspect to it. I have people that only listen on YouTube, and they say, they like it when we have a guest on and then I throw up some visuals and they can go back and check. So I apologize in advance for any kind of a, you're, you're a pro I'm an amateur. So if anything pops up, I'm sorry. That's all right. No worries. All right. Great. So you did 23 years, Colorado Springs. Now, obviously when you get into police work, you're not thinking, geez, I can't wait to roll this into like a Hollywood career. Like this isn't in the front of your mind. Yeah. I mean, you'd be out of your mind if you thought that. And I certainly, it never crossed my mind for a second. And even after it started, I still thought I was dreaming that this even happened. It's remarkable. It really, truly is remarkable. It is proof, my boy, that even a blind pig finds an acorn once in a while. <laughs> That's great. So how, how does it come about? How does it happen besides having a great police career and getting noticed? You know, how did, how did this go down? Well, I was always on the press because I was the murder guy. Everybody wanted to talk to me. There was no division of labor in Colorado Springs. We had one homicide unit. So if you're murdered, you get me. If you're somewhere else, you might get any one of eight or nine different homicide units, depending upon the size of the city. So as a result, I was on the news all the time. There was a guy who was a camera guy for a news station who filmed me many times at crime scenes. He left TV news some 20 odd years before this day and became a producer of television shows and had moved up in his career. He had an idea for a homicide program and he wanted to have somebody that could do that. And his wife suggested, what about that guy, Kenda? You always said he spoke well on camera. So he called me up and I was retired. And he said, I'd like to talk to you. And so we talked. And I told my wife, I, nah, 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 this isn't going to happen. I said, no, you should try. You should go. So I went to Denver. <clears throat> and we went to a location where he had a cinematographer and him. 
And I said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to put you on film. Okay. What do you want to talk about? And he looked at me and he said, tell me about murder. I said, all right. So I did for about 15 minutes. And I stood up and they're both looking at me, the cinematographer and him. And I said, is that what you had in mind? And nobody said anything. And I thought, well, this didn't go well. So I said, let me ask. So what you had in mind? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You just do that. Okay. So I did. I've never had a script in all the things I've ever done. I'm not an actor. I'm a policeman. I say whatever I want. They cut out the profanity. I don't know why they do that. Profanity is the language of the street. But they do that. Other than that, I say what I want. It was true from the beginning and it's still true now. How did Hollywood feel about that? They were elated. Really? They were. They really were. I mean, it's like, wow, the writers all hated me because there was no script, but so what? They, uh, they liked the show. They liked the way I presented it. And obviously the public did as well. So we were very fortunate. That's great. Yeah, I figured they would have, um, you know, in the beginning, they might have a little bit of pushback if you want to, you know, you're not exactly um, an established TV star and you want to shoot from the hip. I figured they might be a little nervous. Well, they were. They were that. They were that. And I, I went to a meeting uh, at, at one of the networks and I said, so, you know, if you want me to tell you about murder, I will. You want me to show you what murder is all about? Come with me and I'll show you. You want some Hollywood program? Call somebody else. That's great. It's great that they had the foresight to to know. You, it's, it's best to go with the subject matter expert. They did. They they decided that, and I said, "Well, good for you. you know, let's do this for real." Because I wouldn't do anything otherwise. So we're not doing a cop show here. We're doing a documentary. We're going to talk about murder cases, real people that get really get murdered by other people who go to prison uh, or get executed for it. That's what we're going to do. And that's what we did. And everybody loved it. That's great. So, can you, Joe, can you take us before the Hollywood days, before the, the illustrious career, can we go back to Patrolman Kenda? Um, oh, yes. Yes, let's, indeed. Let's go all the way back. Let's talk about your first the first call you went on that you would consider like a hot call? I was a young guy. I was 26 when I came on the job. Back then in the 70s, 1973 to be specific, my police academy lasted for two weeks. Whoa. Okay. Then they put you with a senior op. No such thing as a field training program. None of that. Right. They put you with a senior officer. You rode with them for a couple of weeks. If he decided you were all right, they give you keys to your own car. And you're now a one man unit. I love it. It's great. So here I am driving around a city in which I'm completely <laughs> lost. I have a roadmap book on my leg at all times because I have, I don't know where East and West is in this town. Sure. I'm not from, I'm now I'm a policeman by God. And I've got a gun and a pocket full of bullets <laughs> and we're going to force the law, whatever that is. I'm not too sure yet, but I'll figure it out. That's kind of how it was. And the first call I went to when I was making a decision, if I was really wanted to do this was a young Hispanic female who had shot herself in a third floor apartment and had been dead for four days. Ooh. And as I walked up the staircase, another cop is up at the top of the stairs and I stopped suddenly and he said, what's the matter? Can I smell something bad? Hmm. And it was like, oh, my God. And I walked in and looked at this body. And the blood is black, as you know, and on and on. And I I got home that night. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't do anything. And I thought, have you done the right thing here? Is this really what you want to do? And the next day, when I got back in that police car, it's like getting back on a horse. You look at that microphone hanging on that console. And you say... Am I going to pick it up? Yeah, I picked it up. For item 21 is in service. And off we went. 
I love it. But I have a similar experience, Joe, when I was a younger patrolman and um, I went to my first um, like freshly dead person. This was like um, someone I knew because it was a, I was working for an agency where I, I grew up and um, mm. he's just lying there, eyes open. There's um, He was tending bar, dropped dead. The girl from the kitchen came out. She was impishly, futilely doing what she thought was CPR and he's just got that face. And I just bought in a sandwich from him an hour ago. And I remember just getting through that and helping rescue when they showed up. And, and I had the same feeling. I, I just felt uh, it was nauseating to me. And it was oh, yeah. it was way more stressful than I thought. I was like, why is this bothering me so much? And then um, same thing. You, you do come to a point where you have to make a decision where you're like, I'm, I'm just going to power through this. It's good for young cops to hear that because it's, normal and what we see isn't normal your body has to have a has to um acclimate kind of you know of course of course it does and you have to go through that the hard way there's no other way yeah and uh, when i walked out of the police station the first morning to go with a senior officer another officer pulled up in his car by the back door and the where they all everybody came out to get to the car. He looked at me, he stuck his head out the window, and he looked at my name tag. He said, How do you say that? And I said, You mean my name? Yeah. I said, It's Kenda. Well, Kenda, welcome to the greatest show on earth. <laughs> he put the car in gear and drove off. That was prophetic, although I didn't know it at the time. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Joe, I gotta I gotta ask you, um, being, you know, similar line of work, I'm a police officer, although I'm just in patrol, but you know, we we're the first responders for a lot of stuff, hairy stuff. And, um, I still don't like the blood and guts. I still have to keep my head about me about it. And you've, there's no way you've not accumulated all this. I mean, it looks like fun and games when you watch the show. It's like, oh, this is great. What a mystery. It's a puzzle and he's badging gun and he's figuring it out. But really you're living that life. You're seeing this stuff. I mean, almost 400 murders logged in your brain that, I mean, that has to trigger trauma. The worst experience about that after many years of doing it is I was in my office minding my own business. And one of the district attorneys called and said, Hey, can you come to court and testify to the process of a medical legal autopsy? Well, get one of the coroners to do it. Well, they're all in court, Well, they're not all in court. They don't want to pay the expert witness fee because they're all doctors. Right. They have the, $500 an hour to come to court. So he said, in Colorado, if you know more and can demonstrate, you know, more than the average lay person about a subject, the judge will declare you an expert witness. You know, you're a drywall guy or whatever it is. So the DA said, call the morgue, find out how many autopsies you've been to. And we'll use that number and get you qualified. You just do this, do the spiel and how it works and you're out. All right. So I call the morgue. There's this bubbly girl that used to work at the morgue. She's just the happiest person in the world. She works at the morgue, for God's sake. She <laughs> answers, Andy, can I help you? You know? And I said, yeah. I said, oh, it's Kenda. They know my voice. Oh, hi, Kenda. How are you? I said, can you tell me how many autopsies I've attended? Because you're a legal witness to an autopsy. These are not only murders, but questionable deaths and that sort of thing. Right. I would go to the... I want to see what happened here. Yeah, just a minute. I hear the keystroke, and she says, 528. I must drop the phone. Wow. I knew it was a lot. I had no idea it was that many. I was almost sorry I asked her. I bet. Yeah. And you got to see it. You got to see it. The, uh, the whole, the whole shebang right there. Right. The, the totality of what you've seen. That's what they call corners. Canoe makers, right? Cause they make you into a canoe. <laughs> oh, Oh man. Um, can you tell us, can you tell us about, uh, uh, the most strange or bizarre thing that you dealt with? Sure. Cause it was so weird. We couldn't figure it out. We didn't know not only what, but who for some period of time. Fire department responds to a report of an explosion and fire in, in a residential neighborhood. They call the police because they discover human remains. Patrol gets there, and this is an explosion, and this human remains is a pile of goo. Mm. So they 
homicide. Did somebody wire this building? A guy opens the door and fa boom, who knows? So we show up and here is 170 pounds of hamburger in the entrance door of a garage with an apartment over the garage and the door is open. Hmm. Or went off, went off right there. There is nothing recognizable about this person as to whether they're a man, a woman, race, no idea. The only thing intact are their shoes. And I looked at one of my detectives and I thought, I think it's a guy looking at these boots, but we didn't know. So you're thinking, okay, booby trap, what is this? Accidental? What explosive is involved? We call a bomb squad. They show up, they say, wait, this is military, man. We can tell you by the odor. Now, Fort Carson, Colorado is in Colorado, well, not in Colorado Springs, but it's adjoining the city. It's the home of the 4th Infantry Division. They got a lot of things that go bang at Fort Carson. Mm. Uh, there's thousands of soldiers, thousands of civilians, huge. It's a million acres, the largest military army base in the United States in land area. But a division in the field never leave their property. So we call EOD, that's the Army version, Emergency Ordinance Disposal. They show up. And they're looking at things over and they say, ah, it could be a murder round, one guy says, because they're explosive contact charge. Or maybe a claymore. So he's not sure either. So we decide to do a line search to run strings every four feet from the garage to the house. And we walk the lines. Everybody's walking in his line. Patrolman says, hey, Kenda, come here. What? Look at that. Human finger from the first knuckle of the entire finger, and there's a steel ring around the finger. Oh. So I called the EOD guy over. I said, what's that ring? He said, that's a pin from a grenade. <laughs> said, nope. M26 fragmentation hand grenade. That's what that is. And it turns out that this is a guy in his 60s who was a landlord who rented this apartment to a GI, like an E3 in the Army, and they take ordnance home all the time. Really? Machine gun, uh, grenades, all kinds of crap. There's no inventory control on explosives on an army post. The pile looks as big today as it did yesterday, so everything must be here. It's not. It's in the hands of these kids that take it home and admire it. He throws the kid out for non rent, and he left the grenade behind. He oh. pulled the pin. You would think he would have at least seen a John Wayne movie in his life. Right. But a, what's this? I and mean, when he pulls the pin, he discovers four seconds later what it is. That drove us up the wall for quite a little while before we figured that out. Wow. Well, that. That's crazy. That You're right about the military. I, I remember um, right out of college, I was partying outside Boston in a buddy of mine's house. They were living in a triple decker, you know, they're all commuting to the city for work. We're still in our early twenties, mid twenties. And his roommate was in a Marine and he had right on the coffee table. He had like a, you know, a, a 110 millimeter, I don't know, you know, huge ordinance. <laughs> oh yeah. It was live. It was a real, <clears throat> he said, I just took they it when I left. They change commanding generals every two years on army posts. You, when you're a two-star general, you get a division. And then when you're promoted to three-star, you move on. New guy comes in, takes over the division. Every time a CG, a new commanding general, showed up at Carson, they would establish amnesty barrels all over the base. If you have ordnance and you know you're not supposed to have it, and you've got grenades and claymores and ammo and whatever, just put it in the amnesty barrel, no questions asked, and get rid of it that way. They would have to change out barrels every 12 hours. Is it be full? 55 gallon drums all over the post. Have everything you can imagine. It, it explodes. It's remarkable, but there is no trace on any of that stuff. They've got ammo dumps out there from World War II, Bill. So who knows how many bullets are in the place, but there are a lot. And this landlord found one that he shouldn't have found. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, if you think about the military services, I mean, I used to work for, I was a background investigator for LAPD and get a lot of military guys, a lot of military guys of rank and they're like 25 and a captain, you know? So it's like the military is run by very young people and, it is. 
and they we arrest and we arrest a guy downtown with an M60 machine gun and 7,000 rounds of ammo, and he's drunk. He's riding around threatening people with this M60. Where'd you get that? He exactly what armory he took it from. We call the commanding officer, who is a major, who's like maybe 30. <clears throat> we said, are you missing a machine gun? Nope. We have all our weapons. I said, well, I'll tell you what, Major. You better go look again, because if you don't tell me the truth, I'm going to make a phone call and end your military career tonight. He calls me back. Well, there's one missing. Okay, well, I have it. So come down here and recover it. Because the manufacturer says we sold it to the U.S. Army. Not any particular part of the Army, just to the Army. We have no way to trace the gun, but this kid told us where he got it. So they came down and picked it up, and they took him. We let him have him. I said, go ahead, you charge him with something. We let him go to them. So yeah. they took him, did whatever it is they did. Wow. Yeah, that's um, <laughs> the lack of oversight there is pretty, pretty scary. Yeah. Bring it on, bring it on. So, Joe, can you tell us about um, maybe the most intense or or terrifying call, if if there's such a thing for you at this at, at this point? Oh, there was. I was fortunate. It happened right away when I first came on the job. A young patrolman. At that time, we worked days, swings, and mids. You work days, 28 days, swings, 28 days, mids, 28 days, days, 28 days. That's what it went. So I'd been on my own for two periods. I worked uh, 28 days of swings and 28 days of mids. I'm on my first day job I've had since I've been on the job. And it's 7 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> I get into my car. They call me. See the man this address. He wants to report criminal mischief complaint, broken window. Yeah, okay. So I drive over there, park at the curb, get out, take my clipboard, because I'm going to do a handwritten report on criminal mischief, the advertised nature of the call. Knock on the door. The guy jerks the door open and puts a 12-gauge shotgun in contact with my stomach, side by side. No <laughs> he is sweating. He is shrieking. And he says, his first words out of his mouth, you're one of them. I'm looking at this gun, and I'm thinking if I couldn't get my gun half out of the holster before it cuts me in half. Yeah. So I said, I'm I'm not one of them. And for the next 10 or 15 minutes, I don't know what we said because I was having trouble dislodging my heart from my throat. I don't think I could be understandable at that point. <clears throat> but I finally got some degree of wits about me, finally, after about 15 minutes of this. He keeps jabbing that shotgun at my stomach. Oh, my gosh. This is before anybody knew anything about vests, or not that a vest would have mattered at that much. But right. I didn't have a vest. I had a shirt and another shirt. That was it. And finally, I looked at him, and I said, who were, who were them? The aliens that break my windows. Oh, that would have been nice to know before I came here. Mm. The, breaking his window. I said, where, where are they? Well, they're in the backyard. I said, well, let's go get the bastards. Yeah, that's what we should do. I said, look, I, all I've got is this handgun. Do you have more guns in the house? Oh, yeah, I got more guns. Well, give me the shotgun. So I've got something better than this handgun. And you get another gun, and we'll go get him. Great, he says. And he hands me the shotgun. Phew. Turned to go in the house, and I threw the gun behind me. I tackled him and handcuffed him and drug him out to the cruiser. Threw him in a bubble in the back. And he's banging his head against the cage, screaming he's going to kill everybody. And I am shaking so bad I can't drive the car. I can't drive the car. I'm, I'm literally shaking uncontrollably, like I'm freezing to death. Mm. And I grabbed the microphone and asked for a supervisor. I didn't know what else to do. I can't move. And this guy's still banging away in the cage. Sergeant shows it's can't do what? And he just stopped. He looked at me, and he looked at this guy, and he says, what happened? And I told him. He said, Jesus. I said, yeah. He said, what'd you do with a shotgun? I said, I threw it behind me. 
you got a good arm. Why do you say that? Well, it's in the street. <laughs> I didn't know that. I thought I just threw it right behind me. I was so scared. You get that metal taste in your mouth. You can hear your heartbeat and you think you're going to die mm -hmm. right here. I got a wife and two little babies who's going to raise them. I mean, all that shit goes through your head. It does. Yeah. And Ed, you have been had. He's got that shotgun in your stomach. There's nothing you can do. Hope to run your mouth and get him to talk, because at least if he's talking, he's not shooting. But I just, I took me hours to calm down. So I go home. This is the best part of the story. I go home. My son is three years old. He has a battery powered machine gun. I walk in the front door in uniform and the kid pulls the trigger in this thing and says, you're dead, daddy, you're dead. Oh my gosh. Slid down the door <laughs> and my wife says, go to your room. <laughs> she knew what, she knew it was bad. What happened? Oh, you don't want to know what happened. Yeah, it, was, it was incredible. It was incredible. Wow. Now a lot of things that but that was the worst thing that ever happened and i was fortunate that happened right away but that was a that was a story that went around the pd rather quickly and then i became i got a reputation as a shit magnet and if bad things were going to happen it's going to happen to me or anybody <laughs> who was and they were kind of right so that happened a lot that was the worst wow that's um that sounds like it, it would, feel, would it feel like a lifetime 10 or 15 minutes yeah Yes, yes. And I have never, I don't think I could duplicate, if I thought about it, how badly I was shaking. I don't think I could. It just, it was incredible. I mean, I couldn't put the car in gear. I couldn't turn the key. I couldn't get my hand to go where the key, where the ignition switch was. It was incredible. It was just, and it was all the adrenaline and everything else that was happening. But I was absolutely convinced I was going to talk. Yeah. Wow. I know. I, I mean, had the old adrenaline jumps before briefly and you know, your, your big muscles get jumpy and your heart's in your throat. You're like, all right, you, you got to use the radio now. Don't sound like, you know, flustered. You yeah. kind of like a woman. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I know. I know. But it was like, you know, it's all I could do to pick up the mic. Whew. You're, he's lucky you didn't tear his arms off when you cuffed him. Oh, I wanted to so bad, but it was just, I was just, you don't think about that. You just, you, know, you, want, to, you want this to stop. And yeah, it jo stopped. Yeah, Joe, we found the shotgun next to both of the guy's arms in the street there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. I was surprised I threw it that far. I, I really thought I'd just put it behind me. And I threw it all the way out to the curb, which is a standard city lot. You know, it's 100 feet to the curb. <laughs> it's in the street. Wow. But that's. Sure. It's the fear that does it. Mm. Joe, can you tell us about a um, uh, positive or dare I say heartwarming uh, call that you went on? It's also funny, but it's, it's, it's just interesting. This is, again, early on in my career. We get a blizzard. I'm, I mean, a genuine blizzard. It snows sideways for three days. 10, 12-foot drifts. The city's locked up. The governor calls the president and gets him to suspend the Posse Comitatus Act so we can use active duty military to answer calls for service with, at the time, an M60A1 main battle tank and armored personnel carriers. They put a police officer like me in one of these vehicles with an army crew and would respond to emergency calls only. Well, the helicopters couldn't fly for any medical emergency because the wind was 80 knots and blinding snow. So we're it. The tanks and the armored personnel, which I discovered will go absolutely anywhere. They don't care how many feet of snow there is. And I'm in a battle tank, <clears throat> M60A1 with an army crew. We're going to go get a woman who's having a baby, her first baby, and she's having problems. And the ambulance can't get there. The helicopter can't fly. So it's us. So we drive to this house in this tank. Just who some woman wants to show up, a cop, <laughs> a bunch of soldiers. We're here for your baby. Sure. Here comes the army. We're going to, by God, we're going to save you. We get out of the tank and we heroically wade through the snow to the front door. 
We heroically explain what we're doing. We heroically pick up, I pick up this woman. We heroically wade back through the snow and she won't fit in the tank because she's pregnant. She won't go through the hatch. <laughs> There's no way we can get her in the tank. So now we have to heroically go back through the snow into the house. And I said, I guess we're having a baby. And the husband says, do you want hot water? No, they say that in the movies. That's got nothing to do with this. Uh, no worries. Okay, so we, we, we del I delivered my first baby. I delivered several more of my career, but I delivered that kid. And he was just fine. And everything was fine. We would have been having babies for millions of years. Sure. So we were laughing about this. And it's like uh, she was laughing and, and so on. And that was kind of the end of it. So fast forward 20 years. I'm the commander of major crimes. I have two secretaries whose only job is to keep people away from me. <laughs> Bert name, Kenda, five letters. Every night in the newspaper and on press, Kenda said this, Kenda said that, Kenda said, I thought it was an Arab, Kenda Said, you know, S-A-I-D. It always had Kenda said at the end of every sentence. So everybody in the city knew that name. So everybody wants to see Kenda. They don't want to see anybody else. They want to talk to, they come to the police operations center. They want to talk to Kenda because they know he's a policeman. So I had these two girls that just keep everybody out here, unless there's some of them involving a murder case that we're involved in. So my girl comes in, she said, I'm sorry, Lieutenant, there's, there's a woman out here who will not leave. She's got a kid with her and, and she says she has to see you and there's just no way around this. And, and I've tried everything. I said, all right, have her come in. Wait two minutes, call my intercom line, and then I'll tell her it's some emergency and I'll throw her out. <laughs> she said, you don't remember him, do you? <clears throat> I said, no, no ma'am, I'm afraid I don't. You know, you brought him into the world. It was that kid. Wow. When I delivered. Out of the tank. He was in college. She said, I thought you should meet him. She said, it's a story in our family about the tank. That's what I guess it was, you know, and it was just such a warm moment. And I thought I didn't want him to leave. So she calls me on the intercom and it's in the specified two minutes. I said, never mind. And I didn't want them to go anywhere. I said, it was just a pleasant thing. And you don't get many pleasant things when you're the commander of major crimes sure. in your office. And I wanted to sit there all afternoon and talk to that kid and to that woman. It was a nice thing. It's so cool. I mean, so many so many things you do as a police officer through your career is like the most is the biggest thing in that person's maybe decade and to you it's just you're on to the next thing that's you're on to the next thing you don't have time to even think about it you know my my call when i was a sergeant in the homicide i was one x-ray 10. <clears throat> i go to this bad call bad call and uh death and so on and uh I'm sitting in my, I go out and sit down in my car and I'm trying to kind of recover a little bit and the dispatcher, one x-ray 10. And of course I don't answer. And one x-ray 10. You know how their dispatcher could sound like your wife calling you on the radio? <laughs> yes. She's pissed. Now you're not answering. So I one x-ray 10. Good. Patrol's on the scene of a shooting 5200 Montebello. They say homicide. Uh, Roger, one x-ray 10. I'm in route. No time to consider what you were just doing, because now I got to go do something else. That's the hardest part of the job. You never get a chance to deal with that. Yeah, you don't have, you don't have time. Too many things. Yeah, they say that's the difference between because people say, well, you know, firefighters do go to stressful things, and they do, and they they have their own trauma to deal with. But they said with police, they're you're constantly put back on the road. The fire guys do have a lot of time when they go back to the house. They can decompress. They have this natural um, debriefing period built in a lot of times. And with police, it's just get back in your cruiser alone and go back out for the next one. We're not going to talk about it. Right. Which is sure. the way it is. Joe. Uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was up here, right? You're absolutely right. Okay. Um, can we circle back? And we kind of talked about how the, um, you know, it's cool to have the show, but at the same time, you're, you're having, like, when I really think hard about it, the, the things I've been to that I don't really want to think about again, you're having to think about all these things over again because in, in a very sp detailed manner to make the show. So um, right. 
Was that cathartic to you or was that damaging to you? No, it was absolutely therapeutic. It really, really was. I feel much better today than I felt 10 years ago when I started this TV business. I have said things to that camera I've never said to my wife. When I started this program and they decided I didn't need a script, the director and season one, episode one, they said, we want to hear it all. We want to hear everything. You want to hear everything? Yes. And the floodgates opened and they heard everything. There were a couple of times when they walked out of the room. I've never heard anything like that before. So I absolutely dumped things I've been dragging around with me for forever. And it was felt wonderful. It was therapeutic for me. It was better for me to talk about it than to not. And I think that's good advice for anybody that suffers PTSD, traumatic events. You got to talk about it. It doesn't matter to who your wife, your friend, your buddy, uh, somebody on a city bus, talk to somebody, talk it out, admit your failings, admit your fears, admit all the things that go wrong with you when you're seeing something like that. Because if you don't, <clears throat> you're making an admission that you're not a human. And you are a human. And you have to react like one. And that's the difference is an understanding that this is a horrible thing and it has a tremendous effect, a debilitating effect. I still have nightmares. I still have my victims flow by in a river of death every night and they all wave at me. Hi, Joe. Mm. Dead, I say. It's just the way it is. Just the way it is. It's the price you pay for the work. But it's worth it. It is worth it. To put somebody in a cage who needs to be in one. I've often told people this, and it's true. When someone does something unspeakable to someone else, you have two choices. You can remain seated, or you can stand up. I've always stood up, and I've always been proud of that. I like that. That's great. That's great, Joe. Can you? Can you tie that, um, since we're on that subject a little bit, can you, is there any other words of advice you could give to new people? Cause there's, the show has a, a good following. A lot of them are, um, uh, are, are just getting into police work or they're, they're going through the application process. And like you said, there's no, it's always baptism by fire. There's no, you can't really totally prepare, no. prepare them for that adrenaline dump. But, um, that was great advice. Talk to somebody. What else would you tell, uh, like a, you know, a boot coming in? I would tell anybody that's new at this sport that uh, keep your hands in your pockets, keep your mouth shut, and watch and listen. You're going to meet some people you're going to like, other policemen, and you're going to meet some policemen you don't like. Not as many as the ones you like, but we have to recruit our members to the ranks of the human race, which is always a problem. Pay attention to the ones who are successful. Learn from them. Ignore the bitter, angry guy who says the department's out to get him because he's probably right. And avoid him. Spend your time with guys who like what they do and are good at it. And you will learn. And you will become good at it and happy with what you do. That's great advice. And you're so right. The, um, that's a thing when the new guy now, like we talked about, there's field training programs and you, the person's going to go with someone motivated because that's why they were chose to be a trainer. But yeah. even when I first started in early 2000, a lot of times you, they could just kick you with senior patrolmen and maybe senior patrolman hates the job, hates the chief, hates the supervisor, hates the deputy chief, mm -hmm. the lieutenant. And you know, I, I have actually seen supervisors yank young patrolmen out of the car. Who do you go with? No, no. Have them come back to the station. They come back and they go, you go with him. <laughs> That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. It's interesting that there are some people that can deal with the pressures of the job and other people cannot. Now, some of the cannots cannot deal with pressure doing any job. 
if they were a plumber that hate the plumber in charge, they would hate the payroll clerk because they wouldn't pay them enough money. It's a personality issue. But you do find that in police work. You don't find a lot of it, but it's there. There are people who shouldn't be policemen. We try to arrange that and, and find them and get rid of them and all that sort of thing. We're not always successful, but we try. It's always an issue when you hire somebody off the street and you examine him and you test him and you give him a psychological exam and you train him for weeks and weeks and weeks and you put him in a field, tra field training program for weeks and weeks and weeks, there is gonna come a day when you're gonna give him a pocket full of bullets and a gun and a police car and he's gonna drive around the corner out of your sub and you're left with having to wonder I sure hope he does the right thing. And you wonder why so many chiefs are high strung. <laughs> Correct. <clears throat> that is absolutely correct. I used to tell my troops this all the time. I said, if you, I don't care what you do, you can make mistakes. Everybody does. If you do so in the best possible way, you're trying to do your job, then I will, I will go with you to the Supreme Court of the United States if necessary. But if I ever believe you're doing something because it's malicious, because you are engaging in willful and knowing conduct, because you've decided you are the avenging angel. I'm going to send you down the tube. Now we know each where we stand with each other. Can't complain about being up front. I mean, you know where you stand, no. like you said. Everybody understood that. I said, well, he told us. Yes, I did. I told a kid that one night when I asked him, had he done something? And he said, no. I did a little further investigation and it came back to him. I'm going to ask you again. Did you? No, no, sir. I didn't do that. Okay. So I, a third time I said, no, I've done some further work. I want you to think very carefully before you answer me. Did you do this? Well, yes, sir. I did. Okay. Why did you lie to me? Well, I thought I'd be in trouble. You are in trouble. Not for doing what you did. It was a prank against another officer. What you're in trouble for is lying to me. Let me explain why. If I walk up to you, you're standing over a dead man. You've got a gun in your hand. And I say to you, did you kill that man? And you say, no. I don't want to have to wonder about that. All you have in this business is your word. And you've just told me that I can't trust yours. So I'm going to give you 15 days off without pay. And the next time you do that, I'm going to fire you. Remember what I said? Yes, sir. Get out. Leave your badge and gun on my desk. Ooh. What is? Yeah. Hey, that's, what? I mean, that's going to change behavior. That kind of discipline. Well, hopefully. Oh, absolutely. The kid's got a heart, you know. Um, he, he, fine. he did. He turned out fine. He learned his lesson. It was an expensive lesson. Mm. 15 days. Money. Particularly when you're starving to death in the first place. <clears throat> as every police does. But he learned. And he finished his career. He did fine work. He did. A funny story about being new guys and so on. I'm, when I made lieutenant, they make a transfer for a few months out of, out of your command. It's, it's a policy. So I became a watch commander in a division for eight months before I went back to homicide. So I'm in this division, and I've never been in one of these places before, except to maybe use the phone or the bathroom or whatever. So I thought, well, I better walk around in here and see what's in here, because I'm supposed to be in charge. So I'm walking around. I find an armory, holding cells, all kinds of neat stuff. And I'm going by the men's <laughs> locker room. And the there's two kids, brand new ones, and they're changing clothes, putting on a uniform. And one says to, I overhear this, and one says to the other, who's the new commander? What's well, that guy, Kenda? And the other one says, the murder guy? He says, yeah, that guy. I said, that guy's a monster. And I stuck my head around the lockers, and I said, hey, fellas, the monster will see you in lineup in five minutes. <laughs> and I walked out. They stayed away from me for six months. They were terrified. I thought it was so funny. I almost laughed at him every time I saw him, but I didn't. You know, but it was just so funny because it was. And why Reputation. did they think you were a monster? Because you were just so prolific at um, murder investigations. I, I have no idea. I never did find out. I never asked either. But you know, I don't know. That's what they thought. 
the the rumor mill, right? Yeah, no um <laughs> supervisors and command staff never never get a fair shake. They never will. It's just as soon even if you're the well, best one ever, as soon as you leave the room, there's gotta be something, you know? Yeah, absolutely there you go. That's absolutely right. Uh, yeah, just uh, absolutely. So you you enforce the rules. You 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 have policies and procedures, and you follow. And I used to tell guys that I'd say, "You see these two books I gave you: the policies of the police department, three inch binder, procedure manual, three inch binder. You know why they're three inches wide each, and they have so many pages? Because you need to know the content of every page. Step outside those lines, and I will hammer you flat." Here's your books. Have a nice day. Well, it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, it just brings back memories of being in like in roll call and then get briefed and then you got, you're just with other patrolmen and then someone starts defending. Well, you know, or they say they're talking about you know, a new procedure for evidence or whatever. Well, it's not new. And someone will defend the, the supervisor. Well, it's actually not new. We're actually supposed to do it that way. And everybody goes, ah, shut up. <laughs> they don't want to hear it. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, of course. Oh, that's that's too funny. Joe, can you can you tell us um, about your favorite or mo- maybe most exciting, you know, high profile case that you did murder? We had a case that was uh, it was interesting because of the players. Normally, you don't find college graduates getting involved in first degree murder plots. They tend not to do that. Right. When one of them is an Olympic athlete and and was on the Olympic rowing team in 1984, these are not the people that are supposed to behave like this. Wow. A woman, the Olympic rowing person, goes to a gymnasium because her husband's in the Army and he's kind of married to the Army and she's lonely and she's got two little kids and she goes to the gym because she's an athlete. And she meets a guy who is a former college quarterback, football player, made it all the way to the last cut with the Dallas Cowboys before they cut him. He's also in the gym because he, of course, is an athlete. He is married with uh, uh, a wife and three children. They have an affair. The husband of this other woman tells this new girlfriend that maybe they could kill his wife and have $400,000 in life insurance and live happily ever after. Yikes. And they plan this for eight months. Their plan is to carry it out as if it's a street robbery gone bad. And it's a very complicated story. It takes a long time to tell you, but I unraveled it in three days. Their eight month plan and both went away forever. Excellent. And one came up for parole. <clears throat> and I went to the parole here. The woman came up for parole. And I walked by her. She was sitting at the table. I said, how are you? She gives me this death stare. And I said, you know, prison hasn't been kind. Step <laughs> <laughs> over there. So the parole board says, is there anyone here who'd like to make a statement before we make a ruling? I said, yeah, I would. And you are? I'm the arresting officer from 20 years ago. Hmm. We are here to decide if this person, this defendant, is going to be released early on a life term based on a governor's request for leniency. Is that correct? Well, yes, that's that's correct. I said, okay. So I have one question. I'm not sure who I should direct it to. What I would like to know is which one of you will decide if Diane Elaine Hood the victim of this homicide can get an early release from her grave. Would that be you? Or maybe that's perhaps you. Fair question. Woman to your left. Would it be her? They just stared at me. Then they said, motion for dismissal and for release denied. And as I walked past her on the way out, I said, I'll see you the next hearing. That's excellent. I, there was a, a, a intervention. Uh, uh, she died of ovarian cancer in prison. 
So you don't have to donate any more of your time going to that. That's, you know what you did? You just, you just, um, it's, it doesn't yeah. happen a lot nowadays, but you checked everybody's conscience. I do. You made yeah. them check in. Here you go. It's not complicated. You know, they were like, oh. It isn't. <clears throat> to me, the world is black and white. Everybody else is 243 shades of gray. But I don't have that in me. Black and white. I don't forgive and I don't forget. Oh boy, I better not get on your. I better do a good job editing this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, I want to talk a little about uh, about your new book, um, Killer Triggers, because it comes up March 9th, and it it's, it's really fascinating to me because I, I was reading about it, and it's about correct me if I'm wrong, but it's about like the moment where someone, the switch goes on and someone decides to murder. That's, like, that's exactly what it is. The police are in that who, what, where, when, and how business. We're not in the why business. That's a jury question, why this happened. We're who, what, where, when, and how. But I always was interested in why because it could lead me to who. Sure. Now, once I didn't, once I knew who, I didn't care about why anymore. But when I wrote this book, I took examples of my murder cases that I investigated to have the various motivations that are involved in, in death to answer this question. What would cause a seemingly normal person with little or no criminal record, some of whom are children, one of them is 15 years old, to have some reason to set this ball of violence in motion. What emotional trigger was pulled in that person? Was it revenge? Was it money, sex, drugs, jealousy? What was it? It had to be something that made them step over that edge. There's a lot more of them than I realized. I was reading an article about your book, and one of them in there is dementia. And I was like, yes. yeah, of course. I, I mean, who hasn't known someone with dementia that had would have just a flash violent temper? Like I had um, a, a great aunt in the family who, when she had dementia, she would start using four-letter words and threatening violence. And this yeah. is a, a Christian woman. Well, what happens in that, in that situation, and a doctor will explain this to you, there's something called a trans-ischemic attack. It's also called a TIA. Oh, referred to and by doctors as a TIA. But what is a trans ischemic attack? It's a minor stroke. It alters the blood flow in the brain, common in dementia patients. And often a series of them occurs. And the personality of that person leaves them. They become aggressive. They become violent. And if you are a family member, you've got to understand what's happening here. This is a series of TIAs that have forever altered this personality and they are potentially dangerous, which is why they have to be placed in a lockup facility for dementia patients because they put everyone around them at risk. Isn't that scary? Oh yeah, this particular, it's a, it's a chapter in the book about a guy, I titled the chapter, The Undoing of a Good Man, because he was. Wow. I mean, you've probably heard that story about back in the 1800s, a guy that took the railroad spike to the head or whatever, and he was the nicest guy in the village, and he became the biggest jerk anybody yeah. knew. And it, he yeah. died the biggest a-hole in the village because it of course. Yeah. altered his chemistry or brain or whatever. Well, this, this wonderful man who was a retired school teacher and everyone's friend, a dedicated parent, murdered everybody he knew. Oh, my goodness. You're kidding me. No. And he would he would make death lists and leave them around the house. And his wife, they lived alone. They're in their 70s. They lived alone. <clears throat> she would find these lists. She was confined to a wheelchair. She has MS. And the first list were kill the president, kill the governor, kill the mayor, public officials. Then the next list began to be family members. That's way scarier because the other one seems like Seems like dementia, like an unattainable thing. Unattainable thing. But when we were talking about your daughter and your 
25-year-old grandson and your wife of 55 years and your son-in-law? Well, then that's different, isn't it? Wow. And to her minister. <laughs> to her minister. Dog barking. Sorry about that. No problem. To her minister and said what was happening. And his the minister, who is an idiot, says, well, it's just a phase. And what drew you to that conclusion, minister? Since you have no training in psychiatry or in medicine, it's not a phase. And we wind up responding to this place and everybody's dead. He put that seven-year-old kid in a headlock and shot him with a 357 Magnum. Oh my. Own- wow. That, I mean, it's so sad, but like the Council on Aging, where I used to work, we'd sometimes get calls there. And I don't know what's happening. I'm not like a doctor or anything like that, but there was people in their mid sixties at adult daycare who had dementia. I'm talking able-bodied men who could murder a family slipping, losing their minds. And it's the people at the council on aging said, these ones scare us because these are able-bodied men. They're still very strong. Um, it's not yes. like they're in a wheelchair or they're, you know, like they're decrepit. These are uh, no. men that have lost their minds. That's correct. And they, this guy was an example. The, one of the strongest people oh. anybody ever knew. Oh. People that ever met. He was just fine, taking care of his wife, who was ill. But he decides at the end of the day, he's going to stab her 17 times in the oh. chest with a leather awl punch that you use to put holes in belts because he didn't want the neighbors to hear the gunfire because he's luring the rest of the family there for a family breakfast. He it's killed like, her in the morning and then waited for her to arrive. It's like demonic possession. Orange, yeah. Had orange juice poured, tables, silverware, plates, everything. All because he's having this episode of psychosis induced by trans ischemic attacks that no one understood or paid attention to. So it's in your interest to read that book and to start looking around at your own family. Is anybody <laughs> this behavior here? Uh, you know, we need to have a conversation about this. Yeah, yeah. See that. And this guy was a saint until the last few days of his life. Damn. Yeah, my uh, my wife's uncle had a TIA. Totally recovered. Totally fine. You know, he, he was lucky. He didn't lose much oxygen to his brain or anything. And um, but there, like you said, it sounds like he can have a series of them and not even exactly. know. But it's, meanwhile, it's alternating the landscape of your mind. That is correct, and that's the the real issue. Uh, and there was evidence of that in the autopsy because he killed himself as well, of course that there was a series of TIAs, they could see the damage in the brain. Holy cow. But you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here. And all of a sudden, it's way more than a little bit. Yeah, adds up. Um, I don't have much to lose. I I think I'd have one and I'd be in the nut house. (laughs) Woo. Yeah, it's like, wow. You know, yeah. So those things are in that book, and uh, it's uh, written from the perspective of somebody who was there. That's amazing. To heard about it. So graphic on the screen right now. Um, the book's dropping March 9th, Is that correct? That's correct. Mm-hmm. And where can we uh, pick this bad boy up? Anywhere books are sold: Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, Amazon. Uh, I, I recorded the audio version of the book. It's available in ebook, hardback audio you name it it's available that's awesome i think i'll do the audio it's um audio books are like the new best friend to the cop and the beat oh that's absolutely true but i did that uh, and i read it myself which takes a, a long time believe it or not but it worked out well and uh i read the first book as well and uh the result of that was that uh uh it, it made number 11 there times that's all of those the audio version. That's great. And what was important to that is Ruth Bader Ginsburg was number 12. Ah. So much. <laughs> Excellent. The, um, hey, you know, I can see why they wanted you to read it. You have a great voice. 
and great delivery. So, you know, I know you're a busy guy, but podcasting can be lucrative and you can do it on your right. own. No middleman. Uh, I know. That's, uh, it's, uh, that's something I, I've been on a few. I've been on the Nerdist with uh, Chris Hardwick and some others as well that, uh, uh, you know, small town dicks and uh, a few others that uh, operate that system. But as far as doing one myself, uh, I haven't really given that much thought. I mean, I have no intention of retiring. What am I going to do when I retire? Look out the window? I don't think so. Right. Life, I'm going to continue to work. So we'll see. Maybe that'll be the next thing. I don't know. I think you'd like it. I bet I know you'd like it. Um, especially because with what you already have going on, you're going to draw, you'll have an endless list of homicide detectives. You could talk about cases knowledgeably with them. And I, I tell you, you got one fan, at least I wouldn't, <laughs> I, people would be on board for that. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, the small town dicks guys, I was going to have one of them on and then we, we lost touch, but that's a pretty big podcast. Oh yeah. 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 That's really become on to the front. You know, the podcasting is people enjoy it because it's it's real people. It's not invention. I think people have grown tired of fiction because they're it's almost predictable anymore. There's only so many stories you can tell, and and the result is that they're looking for something that's more real that they can identify with. And these people that I deal with are just people, everyday people, like live in your neighborhood. They get themselves involved in these incredible circumstances. And so the listener or the viewer could identify and say, well, I know a guy like that, or I live next door to a woman like that or whatever, because it's true. Absolutely. Yeah. People are, um, people can see, see through the facade and the, the fake stuff. I mean, when the, when those reality shows came out and then they started being scripted. So obviously people were like betrayed by it. They're like, we don't want to watch like, like a scripted real world MTV or whatever. No, 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 no. This is uh, documentary stuff. What I do, you know, uh, and the other thing about, you know, murder uh, cop shows and so on is always the raging gun battles and the and the car chases, all of which doesn't happen. And uh, then, of course, the million dollar motive or the multi million dollar motive by the very clever criminals who wear nice suits and uh, drive around in nice cars. And none of that's true either. None of it. I've had homicides over whose turn it was to put two quarters in a pool table. That's the reality of murder. What is the number one motive? Of all drugs or all issues associated with it. 65% of all homicides in this country are related to narcotics. The sale of narcotics, the failure to pay for them, confusion over who's owed money. As many of these people get high on their own supply and they get confused about who didn't pay and they shoot the wrong guy. All those kinds of things happen all the time. So they account for over half of all homicides. Narcotics issues of various types. There's a lot of subparts to that. But only 5% of all homicides are stranger killers. 95% people are known to each other. They're romantically involved. They're involved in a business transaction. They're involved in a criminal enterprise. They're involved in something. That's and comforting. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's better. Yeah, I've, I've interviewed some people. I think it was um, Pomona Cop, and uh, they had this like horrific. Um, I might be misremembering all the details, but the, I know they had a horrific drive-by, and it was so scary because it was just a random act of violence where they just shot a bunch of people in their yards, and it was like mm -hmm. usually the police can come on the news and go, "This was not random. This was targeted. These are drug dealers." You know, they, it was in infighting, but when it just happens randomly, that's when you're like. Like when the home invasion happens and the family's killed, that's when you're like, oh, that's that's real scary. It is real scary. Unfortunately, it's not common, but yes, it happens. Of course it does. We live in a fine little world. And it's not just confined to the United States. People like to say that, but it's not true. The whole world is violent because there are humans all over it is the reason. That's why wild animals run from us. They know what we are. Yeah. No, I saw, um, let me, um, quote back at you, your own quote, but a while back I saw you on a show and you were, you were de describing how you wanted to get into, um, investigations or police work. And you went to the zoo or something and you, it said around this corner is the most dangerous animal in the world. And then of course it's a mirror, you know, and then it just has a kid. You were like, boom, that's an interesting thought. Yes, it is. Oh yes, it is. 
And it's true. It's absolutely true. We're not that far out of a tree. We like to believe we are, but we're not. We just wear nicer clothes these days. But we're just as violent as we were. Yeah, unfortunately, it's true. Joe Kenda, I'm honored to have you on. Thank you so much. Is there is there anywhere... Um, I've taken up an hour of your time, so it's a good time to wrap up. Um, is there anywhere you want people to follow you or um, anything like that? Website? No, I don't have any of that sort of thing. I don't. I don't. I mean, the, the, my network, Investigation Discovery, maintains Facebook accounts and a Twitter account in my name. But I'm never on either one. These are other people that do that. God bless you. And I just, uh, I don't get involved in social media. I just don't. That's great. Uh, you're just good. You're just good. You're good at, you're so good with these shows and you're so marketable that you don't have to do that hustle. That's, that's a testament to itself. I think, I know a bunch of my listeners are going to get this book. Um, it's, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get the audio version, but it sounds incredible. Um, I know it's going to be great. Just came from your mind. So that's all I need to know. Joe, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been fun. I've enjoyed the conversation. Oh, great. I'm glad. As opposed to anybody else. You know. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. See you later. Yeah, I'll um, I'll just let me wrap it up and then um, sure. just hang on the line. You bet.